there's a number of amazing discoveries in the Magical Egypt series. Um, let's just start by talking about the fact that there are things about ancient Egypt that many people find unsatisfying because traditional Egyptology focuses on certain provable things, but there's huge parts of the Egyptian story that don't seem to be addressed by Orthodox Egyptology. So as artists, when an artist comes to ancient Egypt, uh, can you talk about your first impression of the aesthetics of ancient Egypt and how they're sort of at odds with this, the the history and the historical story that we're told about Egypt. Yeah, the, uh, it's funny that you say that because um, when I went on to John's trip, I think it was maybe the second day we went to the, or maybe the, uh, the third day, it was early, very early on, and we went to uh, the museum in Luxor. And uh, that museum is, is, it was one of my favorite parts of the trip because it's, it's so much smaller than the Cairo Museum, and the Cairo Museum is just that infinite warehouse of just stuff everywhere, and the Luxor Museum is much more kind of all the artwork is much more neatly arranged and, and and it's not just this big cluster of stuff, you know. Um, but we went in there and uh, I think there's a statue of uh, Tutmosis III and it's just this sort of just him just standing there walking, stepping forward. And uh, it was it was one of the more amazing statues I think I've, that I've ever seen. Um, in that it was so simple and, and it almost seemed like graphic design to me. It, it seemed very, uh, it, if you think of like uh, Michelangelo's David where you're seeing like the veins and the hands and you're seeing just every little minute detail and that's insane that somebody could do that out of stone anyway. Yeah. But the Tutmosis the, the third was very boiled down and refined but it, was, it still had that same sort of striking, just all the proportion and all the balance. And looking at those, the other, the other, sculptures in that museum from an artist's point of view I'm like there's no way this is done by primitive people there's there's there's, there's, there's this is this is so brilliantly and well done and it's done out of stone it's i mean it's that's you know i mean if you were to give somebody a a, a, a block of, of stone and say go carve a symmetrical face in it you know how soon before you're going to do that before you're going to get this perfectly symmetrical perfectly proportionate face and that going into there and seeing, I was already, you know, after watching the first Magical Egypt and I, I already knowing, you know, John's main sort of thesis about a lot of that stuff, I was already going in there knowing that this was not a primitive people, but that was just the nail in the coffin was the Museum of Luxor because it, it, it's, it's just such the craftsmanship and the ability to, to do those things is, you know, primitive artwork is on your refrigerator that your kids draw. I mean, that, that's primitive. You know, the kids that don't know what they're doing and they're just scribbling and doing so. This is, the, the statues in Luxor were just completely indicative to me of people that completely understood art and understood how to use these tools and understood how to, to communicate things. And just, like I said, try and carve a proportionate human into, into like the ratios of phi out of these blocks of stone. And those, those are brilliant people who are doing that, you know. There's a certain amount of trouble you go to in art where you have a regard for aesthetics. And then there's something way above and beyond that where the message of the art has to do with the geometry and the uh, geometric templates. Uh, I had the same experience myself when I first uh, encountered the art of Egypt. Uh, I'm a graphic designer as well. And yep. there is a a prestige to graphic design, uh, as in music and in a lot of creative endeavors, where a novice or a beginner artist will start by expressing his uniqueness and his personality through a piece of art, and uh, sometimes including cultural references and time-based things. And as you become greater as an artist or a musician, you stop relying on, well, in the case of music, you know, at a certain point, you stop relying on guitar effects and amplifiers, and you start using your mastery of chords and tonal things, and your mastery of the instrument starts to surpass your need to express your personality. There's a timelessness in Egypt that is, in my opinion, the completion or the, the highest uh, place that art can get to. And in fact, uh, there was a contribution from another one of the contributors in the show, Aaron Cheek, um, put a word to this that I think we all know, but it's just such an easy, simple word, this word didactic. The art and the architecture in Egypt was didactic. And it was not only didactic to other artists, which it is on a number of levels. You're not really a complete artist until you understand 
the art of Egypt and the mechanisms of Egypt. But when you understand that that art wasn't to decorate a room, the art in Egypt and aesthetics in Egypt and the architectural aesthetics weren't for decoration, they were didactic, they were transmitting a message. So one of the things that, one of the first remarkable developments that we feature in Magical Egypt is this idea that the art is not just decoration, that it is in fact didactic and that it is expressing a message and it is to the ancients obviously was one of the most was the centrally most important message that there is and when you see this art you understand that it's trying to communicate something you understand that it has a message and when you understand that this was an educational experience going to the temple you were learning this ancient wisdom tradition and the temples were there to express and transmit this ancient wisdom tradition that was generally understood in egyptology and in in historical circles what the message was is the thing that everyone has missed and one of the remarkable things that we break through to in magical egypt is it starts with the discovery of a a key or a cipher. One of the things that we've talked about is this very well could be called the new Rosetta Stone on a number of different levels. Well, one of the things we're going to talk about today is the way, this ingenious way that the art and architecture use geometry and number and symbolism to convey this really robust and sophisticated science. And when you understand what this Rosetta Stone, how the Rosetta Stone works, and you're able to look past all of the superficial things and actually hear the message of the ancient world. It is one of the strangest, most taboo, and yet most important, most centrally important things that a person can know. Uh, and in the show, we discuss it as it is literally the central mystery of existence. They are secrets that are being transmitted in the art and in the architecture of ancient Egypt that are scientific in nature, but they're a branch of science that our science has yet to catch up with. It's a science that seems to be focused on not the external universe of matter, but the internal universe of consciousness and the invisible world of the causal forces, the netters, or the numbers, or the natures. And so the message of ancient Egypt had to do with the way consciousness interacts with the material world. And as an educational experience, there's never been one more important, more lofty, or more useful to the individual, because this isn't some external thing that is only of interest to historians. This is a schematic of the human mind, a schematic of consciousness. And not only that, but a remarkably, weirdly, anomalously accurate schematic of the hardware, of the, the wetware that produces consciousness. Uh, can you talk about your path of discovery about how you first noticed that this art wasn't just a representation of the female form, say. Um, you want to talk about the ram first, or you want to talk about Venus first? Um, well, it, uh, I mean, as far as how, for myself, I think, it, like, for so much of this stuff, it's just that other people have already been figuring out, I mean, that, I mean, Schwaller's already, the fact that he, um, showed that the temple is laid out to the body i mean to me is the the biggest sort of revelation of that whole thing and obviously that was being done in hindu temples and other structures like that but that aspect of the, of the first magical egypt was probably one of the biggest takeaways i think for not only for me for, but for a lot of people but when you realize that this this house of god was being using the human body as its blueprint for it that i mean then you just start going okay they're, they're talking about the physical body in where else are they doing it you know and and um like John points out, the Schwaller point that in in Luxor, when you're in the where the lungs are, the art on the wall is de, you know talking about things that are happening in the lungs and that sort of thing. So all that stuff's already been established, you know. And and so for myself, you know, and you, you, you when you start investigating consciousness, you know, everybody talks about the pineal gland, right? And so you have to go looking to find out what that stuff is, and, you, and, you, and you're just already in the head, right? You're already in the brain. You're already you're already looking there anyway. Um, and so you already have this establishment that we're dealing with the human form in relationship to the houses of, of, of divinity or these houses of God. And so it, it's, it, it seems like that's a pretty uh, already established route to just find yourself in and go, okay, all these other people have already told us this, that we should be looking to the body. Um, but also, I mean, the other interesting thing too is that that whole as above, so below thing that you could, that the artwork is not only depicting things happening in the body, but also the, you know, the movements of the heavens and these celestial, you know, imagine that to me is one of the most brilliant aspects of, 
of the this work of art is like, can you imagine making a work of art where you not only are using metaphors to describe processes in the human body, but this, and, and you're doing this sort of double entendre where at the same time you're talking about the body, you're talking about the, you know, the movement of the sun through the 12 signs of the zodiac and that sort of stuff. And that's just a masterful work of metaphor and artwork and symbolism to be able to put that into the same stories and the same artwork and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, it was there, through with the RAM, um, and that's really what, that's what really kind of really opened up the whole thing for me was just looking at uh, Google image searches. And the thing that always cracks me up is not that long ago, I can remember going to the library in Seattle and having to go to their image library and look through filing, you know, look through and look through, you know, if I wanted to find a picture of an elephant, you go to E and you go through the thing and maybe there's somebody has cut out a couple of pictures of elephants from some old National Geographic or something like that. But now you type in elephant and you get every single picture of not only an elephant but everything relating to elephants you get cartoon versions you get you know you, you get every, you, that image resource that availability is something that i think we kind of take for granted that that you just get this download of everything you ask to show me you know it's like that scene in the matrix when he says he wants guns and all these rows of guns just go flying past him we're that getting too. that with images yeah um, but so I just started looking at images and I saw that one plastic model of the brainstem and the way the thalamus looked like, I was like, it just looked like a, you know, it looked like if I was going to make a stick figure or a cartoon of a, of a, a snout of some sort of cartoon animal and, and, and seeing the, uh, the brainstem underneath it, it just triggered something in my head that I'd seen this before and out those Ram Sphinxes out in Karnak, um, from a graphic design point of view, those are really cool looking. They're, they're, so, and there's just row, they're, just, they're, you know, they're all lined up in a row, there's a bunch of them. And so, you know, for someone who's interested in design and that stuff, I was kind of immediately drawn to those and they just always stuck out in my head. And when I saw that plastic um, image in that Google image search, looking up brain stems and stuff like that, the proportions of it all. And, the, and the, you know, I was just like, I've, I've seen this, I, I know what this is, and, then I, and I went, it. it there's that Ram Sphinx at, at Karnak that has, you know, is it Ramses the second that's supposed to be Osiris, I think, who's the statue. Um, and I just saw that, and then you see the the horns of the ram sitting on top of it, and you just it just all kind of looks exactly like what what the brain and the brainstem look like. So we're going to play a quick clip right now from episode two of magical Egypt series two that details how Brad came about this discovery so that you understand what we're um, talking about. Here's a little clip from episode two of magical Egypt series two. Within the brain, there's a part of the brain called the hippocampus and the hippocampus starts in the, the middle of the brain and it goes off on both sides and has this kind of curved horn shape to it. And what Bill Donahue pointed out was that there's a part of the hippocampus which is called Amun's horn, at, named after the Egyptian ram-headed god Amun, who has these same kind of curved horns. And the interesting thing about that was that term for Amun's horn in relationship to the hippocampus uh, was coined in 1784 by a French anatomist uh, whose name I'm going to butcher, so I'm not going to say it. But our ancestors were showing us in their artwork examples of the hippocampus in relationship to Amun's horn. If you can see in images of the hippocampus, it spirals off just sort of right by the ear. And there are some Greek coins uh, from about, I think, 300 to 280 BC that were depicting Alexander the Great. And in these coins, Alexander the Great has the horns of a moon. 